in the back. I'm going to invite our panelists up. We've got to talk more about how to get involved, what you can do, tactics and tips, etc. So we've got Chris Brandt. He is the founder of Charity Agency. He also founded Music Heals. We have Elizabeth Moffitt, the Associate Director of Marketing and Communications at VGH and UBC Hospital Foundation, who also is um, a digital genius, I like to say, who came from SFU and Canucks Place. We have Reka Pavanatharaja, yeah, <laughs> the Director of Engagement and Development at Art Starts, who has been there for nine years and uses creativity as an essential part of learning and the work they do. So let's give them a warm welcome. Thanks. Okay, first off, I like to ask, how do you get involved or your organization with Giving Tuesday, if you get involved. I mean, I invited them all here for this panel, so I think they do get involved, but yeah, I had eye contact with you first, Reka. Yeah, yes. Thank you. Um, yeah, for us, it's been a bit of an evolution. I've been with Art Starts for nine years, and I think our organization has participated in Giving Tuesday, I think, for the past seven years. Um, it's only in the past three years, including this one, that we are leveraging the, the movement with an actual event. So one thing that really struck and stuck out when you spoke about um, not making it about a transaction and, and more about um, the person, the donor, um, I find that with an event, that's an opportunity to really connect with the person and to be able to offer a point of engagement and inspiration about your mission so that they feel inspired to give because I think that was one of the hardest aspects for uh, participating in Giving Tuesday over the past years where it was kind of in isolation. It was just online, web-based, um, and really it yielded uh, under $500 worth of donations and it largely came from, a do I would say our board, member and board members and staff. So the big shift for us has been um, producing an event and really sort of jump-starting that as a way to connect people with our mission. Um, yeah, so uh, where I am now at VGH, we, uh, we use the opportunity to do um, uh, an email match from one of our board members. Uh, so we get to show, we get to do a match, plus we get to show one of our board members a lot of love. Where uh, I've done previous campaigns, uh, it was more, I think, about engagement where the, the dollar amount was important. But um, I think just as important was um, taking the opportunity to, to show people who donated that day some extra love and to uh, get new people, even if they didn't donate that day, even if they just gave an email or signed up for something. Um, I'm currently consulting with charities and not working for one specifically. So um, I think we're going to, there's a lot of can of worms to get into this, this whole conversation. Real but talk. Yeah. Um, uh, the event aspect is is great, and, and one of my companies I consult for helps facilitate that. Um, I think, I, I'm, I'm glad you explained the beginning of Giving Tuesday, because I think the original ethos of it was positive. I think it's I think it's gone sideways. Um, I think a lot of things have, have taken the power out of Giving Tuesday. Um, how many of you are like music fans and know what Record Store Day is? Anyone? Music nerds, please, anyone? <laughs> All right. <clears throat> So Record Store Day is, is one day a year. We have an industry who has even slimmer margins than charities, record stores, uh, and they pick one day a year where they all have a sale. And every record store, it's now international, every record store around the world uh, has a sale on the same day. So you can travel to Chicago, and if you know it's Record Store Day, you know the local stores are doing it. Um, the people, the industry got behind it, and the record labels started creating packages for that day, and cool labels like Jack White's label would create, you know, a thousand copies of this one piece of vinyl, and there's a thousand stores, so they each get one. The idea was that um, it was a collective movement, not about give to me, which I think Giving Tuesday has transferred into, you need to give to us on Giving Tuesday. I think it's, if we go back to this original, what I assume is the original tent of, give to anybody, like a high tide floats all boats. If everyone's sending the same message, just give to someone on Giving Tuesday, not give to me. With Record Store Day, the record stores 
individually tried to add value to it. I find that the charities try to take from Giving Tuesday as opposed to like it's Giving Tuesday, you should be giving, which I know like you work for a charity, what the fuck are you doing the other 364 days of the year? Um, you're used to giving back. But I the record store model is each individual record store tries to add something of value to the collective day. And the charities, particularly in the last few years, have made it inward as opposed to supporting the overall thing. So that's rant number one. <laughs> oh, is that rant number one? Okay, one of. <laughs> you know what's interesting? Both of you, um, Chris and Reka, you both mentioned the events are good. And this is always what really fascinates me about Giving Tuesday is it is an online hashtag global movement to bring communities together. It's meant to be on platforms of social media. However, so often I'm starting to hear the most successful Giving Tuesday campaigns are coming from when people are having their actual fundraiser on that day and then still um, using social media platforms to uh, promote it. Has anyone else done that before in here? Or can we think of another example where that happens with hashtagging social media platforms where it's about your digital community, it's about bringing anyone together to your cause no matter where in the world? Bell Let's Talk does that very well. And then they bring it, yeah, and then they have a great example, and then they have an event to celebrate it. You have... Sorry, what was that called? Twitter? Uh, it's called Twestival. Twestival. For us, it was 2009. It was nice to connect the online and offline community. We got to meet everybody offline. And I got to work with the community builder. And we got to build those relationships offline, too. Connecting online with offline. <gasps> Fridays for Future. <laughs> Interesting. So what does success look like? What does success look like? I'm going to ask Liz first. In Giving Tuesday, like what would success look like to your staff and to your board? Um, I, I mean, for, for us where I am now, it, it does, unfortunately, I think mostly come to the donations. If you're, if you're thinking about, you know, what number you can, you can bring up to your board. But I think that you can still measure and celebrate. You should at least be measuring and celebrating a lot of other things, like um, new people that you're bringing in, um, engagement levels, um, more of that kind of like soft numbers. Even if ultimately your board wants to hear a dollar figure. Sorry. Anyone else want to take on what success looks like? Um, I, I think change the narrative. I think. Um, remove fundraising altogether from the day. I think one of the things that you could be most successful with is playing the long game uh, and treat it as stewardship day. Particularly if your major donors are corporations, this doesn't work as well if your major donors are individuals or private foundations, but if they're corporations, playing on corporate social responsibility, starting now, identify your major donors and make an Instagram graphic, like a square thing um, with their logo you know, on Giving Tuesday, we're proud to, you know, show our support for, and then put your logo for your charity. It's an opportunity for you to get free advertising. Corporations have no excuse to post on Giving Tuesday. Give them one. And if their followers learn about your charity from them, that means a lot more than you posting something on Giving Tuesday yourself. So I would, I would treat it as stewardship day. We're not gonna ask anyone for money. We're gonna blow some sunshine up the butts of our major donors. Um, but it's, it's, I mean, I say that facetiously, but it's, it's of value to them because it's, whether it's to their staff to show that they're giving back that staff members might not know about, it's to their customers. Like we, we have a, we have our in-house charity. We have our favorite charity on Giving Tuesday. This is who we've given to all year long or on Jeans Day or whatever event they gave to you during the, maybe it was last Christmas they gave you money and this is your way to give them a chance to show off 
how they're supporting you, that in turn, if they get feedback from that, if they get, you know, 300 people liking that post and commenting and good for you, they might go back into their board meeting going, we need to give more to them next year because they made us look good. Yeah, I hear you on the stewardship piece. I think that's definitely a big driver for our the event. Uh, I'll speak to the event because that's really what we focus on and do for Giving Tuesday. And um, it is the time for us to invite donors, for us individual donors in particular, um, to be able to thank and and give a, an opportunity to see like our mission in action. We're an arts organization, so we always have something creative, um, arts focused um, to experience. And so, yeah, stewardship is huge, but also to ensure that um, we are opening up and building, building audiences through that process as well. So stewarding existing donors, inviting new folks to, to learn about who we are and what we do. Um, and then I think this year we kind of made the decision that yes, we have a bit of a soft target in terms of what we'd like to reach, but the bigger part is actually thinking about um, bringing these folks into the pipeline so that we can actually now ask them to support us um, during the end of year fundraiser. Because for us, Giving Tuesdays, the jump is sort of the catalyst for the end of year campaign. And it's one of like a appeal, which is like a way in which you achieve your target. Um, and so I would say, yeah, we definitely think about stewardship and not just think about um, asking. Oh, I like it. This is, uh, y'all have remarked on that Giving Tuesday is a tool in the toolkit of your end of giving year campaign. Uh, why I love Giving Tuesday is it's a date you can't hide from. I work with a lot of nonprofits that are under-resourced and they have to be as efficient as possible and maximize all their time. So putting all resources into this day that might be disappointing, they really have to think through how they can maximize it. And one thing I always recommend is it can be a jumping point. It's a day you can't hide from. It's like a gala, it has a set date, and then it launches you into the rest of your December end of year campaign. That's, and then when you were saying you do like a fundraiser or a friend raiser on that day, which is exciting. So then a couple of weeks later, they get more asks via digital or other ways outside of that Giving Tuesday date. So why should I love this question? This is what I always ask because I'm the community leader. And so I get everybody's stories to feed to the media. Like I do the press for Giving Tuesday. So I'm like, tell me your stories. And I've pared it down to this thing because people will tell me lovely things, but I'm like, this is what I want you to tell me. Why should I care and what is the photo op? If you were gonna do something on Giving Tuesday, why should I care as a potential friend, donor, volunteer, um, so social media amplifier, why should I care? <laughs> it's a hard question. Um, I, I think the, the question is, is perfect in um, underlining the fact that the media needs stuff to talk about. Uh, the media wants to talk about you, particularly this time of year. Um, as per your introduction, Giving Tuesday is attached to U.S. Thanksgiving weekend, which this year happens to put Giving Tuesday in December, which, as you said, is 34% of donations. Some charities, it's 50% in December. Um, the media is looking for stories. You know, uh, global television will pick seven charities and focus on one a day for a week, usually in December. Um, there's nothing to talk about in Giving Tuesday. Uh, something that you and I talked about on a street corner of just like what would be cool ways for things is, and this doesn't work for every charity, but if you're a brick and mortar charity, if you're someone, I would assume, you know, with your organization in particular, uh, be a lot harder at VGH, is the opportunity to invite, invite people in and do something. If you're Giving Tuesday, Imagine if there was, uh, you know, like the East Side Arts crawl. Imagine if there was a charity crawl. If even yes. 10 charities in Vancouver got together, we don't need 100. If 10 charities in Vancouver created a, a charity crawl on Giving Tuesday, the media would go nuts. You would get coverage on every single outlet in the city. They are looking for something to talk about. Now, you've got to get creative. Is it, you know, you mentioned uh, an organization who built bikes 
in a day and we're donating them and and so you got to get creative what that thing is the public could possibly come in and do with your organization whether it's working with the people that you serve uh, that's too wide of a brush for me to even guess what you could possibly offer but if you have a brick and mortar location or someone that you work with um, and took that to the media we're one of 10 charities that want you to come by on Giving Tuesday and participate or build furniture or make pizzas that we'll deliver or whatever um, the opportunity to hook the press in this town would be unparalleled but I don't see anyone doing it that sounds like the job for the community organizer <laughs> Next year, coming to you next year. I think that's a great idea. And it would come back to as an under-resourced, potentially under-resourced organization. What is the value of you participating in that? Because it might still not lead to donations that day. So again, this is where I encourage people to say, set out what does success look like? If your email list is 100 email addresses and you were to try and do something that you can get a data capture for, and get 50 more email addresses or 100, that is a huge success because now you can get them in your ladder of engagement and actually really start communicating with them outside of that day. This day is to get people in your pipeline and to build the ladder of engagement. And so a charity crawl like that would be phenomenal and it would probably take some work. But what does success look like? Getting people and your brand out there a bit more, I think is huge. So uh, maybe stay tuned next year, 20, 2020. Honestly, if the three of you talked talk to Amanda afterwards and did it, that would be enough for us. That is true. Like, do it this year if it's an easy engagement. I love it. Okay, failures. Who here has a Giving Tuesday campaign that they wouldn't mind sharing that they feel like did not look like the success they wanted it to? Any takers? on our panel or in our, our friends out here yeah. has anyone done a giving tuesday campaign I, feel like Eli's at someone mm -hmm. I know what's the eye contact for over there you do So, Richard, are you coming out with us after? After our panel discussion? With a whole bunch of people in this room, maybe we can have a further conversation around um, how we can support that. that Thanks for sharing. You no, thank you for sharing. That was really a uh, vulnerable of you to share, and I'm sorry to hear that, but let's figure out some things for you moving forward. Thanks. Anyone else? You seemed excited before. Yeah, Failure. I, kinda, I can talk about... Um, I can talk about failure just like a little bit outside of Giving Tuesday because when I think about um, Giving Tuesday in particular, um, there are, it's more related to small little failures that have um, created obstacles in order to achieve sort of the end goal. Um, I love think, I'm grateful to be at an organization that really embraces failure and um, we really appreciate the concept of like failing fast and that's where um, thinking about the small failures is helpful 
um, just actually currently um, with this year's event, we kind of had a mini failure in landing uh, a venue. Um, and oh, no. landing a venue, we solved it, but the, the failure um, created a little bit of a fury of like just trying to figure out what, what to source and um, potentially changing dates, et cetera, et cetera. And as a result, um, we actually landed at a venue that is even better. Um, and it suits the environment and the sort of, um, yeah, the experience that we were hoping to capture actually with this option is so much better. But I just wanted to use that like small example of thinking about um, failing fast and that's something I learned in like design thinking even because it allows you to iterate um, using using that concept to apply it back to like the design of what you're trying to produce um, when you do make those when you do encounter failures very quickly you're allowed to you're able to recover faster and and often what you're trying to produce is even better so yeah I just wanted to offer that as a just sort of a overview versus um, just thinking about like a really big failure outside of what's what I endured just recently this week, but yeah, that's what I'd have to say about failure. Oh, I have a failure story I can add. Of course I do. I have a failure story as being the community um, leader for Van Gives. I think it was a year or two ago, um, as the media spokesperson, I collect stories and feed it and uh, have press releases, do stuff, and I get a lot of support to do that. And I was watching the news so excited that someone had to have picked up one of our amazing, what we call activations. What's going on that day? What's your campaign? What's your activation? And as I was watching, there was like this amazing activation. I can't even remember. It was that amazing. I can't remember it. But I was like, who in this city did that without me knowing? And I was like, one, that's amazing because you can't really harness movements, right? That's such a compliment if they're just like expanding outwards, right? But I was like, as I started watching further, I went, that's from like the AP wire. It's a New York thing. There's so much happening in Vancouver. So I... Um, I was frustrated in our local media, but not to um, because they're under-resourced, so this isn't a criticism on that, but just in a way that then helped the next year, how I approached, again with relationships. Spoiler alert, not everyone's going to open a press release from someone they don't know if they don't feel like they have that photo op hook in it, and I needed to really hustle and build those relationships and call them myself to get more of a focus on actual local activations that were happening that I know the media would care about. They're just under-resourced as well. So um, that was one of my learnings from that. Did you have one? No, it's okay. I, just in general, I think it's important to keep in mind that the, the timing of it connected to Black Friday and Cyber Money, M Monday, mm -hmm. a lot of people don't have money come mm -hmm. Giving Tuesday. Like everyone yeah. <laughs> spent their disposable income in the four days leading up to it. Um, leading into December where then people shift into making their gifts. But um, yeah, I, I think there's, there's probably everyone in the room probably has stories of not hitting their financial goals for Giving Tuesday. And I think shifting it to a non-financial goal is, is the opportunity. It's a day with so much noise mm -hmm. um, that to plan, it, again, as you said, it's one of the things in the toolbox. If it's, your, it's, a, if it's a big fundraising day for you, you're in trouble. Um, you know, but the opportunity to create stories Traditional marketing says that people need to see something eight times before they recognize the logo or the catchphrase or the packaging or whatever. No one, you know, obviously, no one gives to charities they've never heard of. Uh, it's your chance, you know, if, if people need to see something eight times before they donate to you, Giving Tuesday might be one, mm -hmm. you know, and, and now they've heard of you. They've removed the who, like, it's, it's the long game. When you get to eight, they might make a donation. Um, it might be eight for somebody, but, it's uh, it's just getting another you know single off um, the people of just re removing the people who don't know about you kind of day. Do you have a favorite example of one? It doesn't have to be one you created or participated in, but even if you have seen one globally. Um, I loved what I saw. Um, I think it was United Way Calgary did last mm. year is they did a uh, um, a match campaign, except it wasn't like 
we'll match your money. We'll, it was, we'll give you $20 from whoever our matcher is and you get to pick which area. So it's United Way. So they have, you know, like senior support and early education and teens and stuff like that. Um, so they were using it clearly more as like an email acquisition thing and to, to basically um, tell all these new people about them and sort of all the work they do and find out what they were interested in. Um, and I thought it was just a, a really smart use of the day and of the match. And they gave away money? Mm-hmm. Well, they let you, yeah. you got like $20 to give back to them, essentially. So yeah, you got to cool. pick where to put it, though. I love it. Canada Helps did that before. Gave out $3 gift cards to folks. Woo! Yay! Because people usually chip in more than three bucks. It's a $3 gift card. You had some of those a couple years ago. Yeah, at your event. Tim did that last year, ten dollars. Okay. Same sort of stuff. Encouraging giving. Mm-hmm. Anyone else have a favorite example? Anyone else out here have a Giving Tuesday favorite example? Oh, I have many. I'm gonna tell a local one. There was um, again this whole idea of bringing these digital movements into physical spaces to really connect with each other in that way, is that uh, the, um, well, Science World did one one year where they had a free night and they had this epic long lineup to get in for free. Uh, the other year, one I really liked was the Stanley Park Eco Society. I got that name wrong. I'm sorry, Stanley Park. Is that they have a program where they build bird boxes together and they decided to do that activation, that item, on the literal day of Giving Tuesday. And it got so much attention and people were so thrilled and it just... They didn't raise much money, but it elevated, they got in the media, it elevated their brand, and people knew a little bit more of what was happening in Stanley Park. There has been partnerships. Oh, I love collaboration. I love collaboration. And again, I'm going to use the word media. They do too. Was when um, Ballet BC sold um, discounted tickets. If you bought one, they then gave one to a partner uh, child organization who typically wouldn't be going uh, to the ballet or be able to afford it. So that was a, an exciting activation to see as well. So items like that, right? Um, those are ones that pick up some momentum for that day. And bear in mind, none of those made money. And those were deemed incredibly successful. Okay, so this is the big one. How do you prepare for Giving Tuesday? How do you prepare? Like, what do you, what do you do before? What do you do the day of? And then what we should do after? Go for it. You got it. Um, honestly, I've always kind of prepared for it just like you would any other campaign. I mean, it's all the same the same things, you know, like getting a plan and getting all your assets together and, and figuring out what you want to do and what, you, what your, your goals are going to be. Um, I do think it's an opportunity to have more fun with those things, but in terms of planning, it's it's about the same. Um, I I do think that that it tends to I guess get a lot more attention because it is at the beginning sort of of the season, as opposed to things like at the end, like like uh, like year end giving doesn't tend to get the same amount of, of planning, at least where I've worked before, which is probably unfortunate because more comes in then anyways. But um, yeah. Yeah, I would agree. I think it takes up pretty much the same amount of energy as um, thinking about our year-end campaign, especially when there's an event involved. Um, Yeah, it ends up being a little bit of a mini campaign on its own because there is the component of um, like the web-based content. We are planning to do about, I think, six emails that are um, staggered. Um, leading up to Giving Tuesday and on Giving Tuesday, as well as Thank You Thursday. Uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, because there's a little bit of the pre- preamble of like getting our audience to understand what Giving Tuesday is, as well as kind of building the narrative around our, our organization and mission, and then the thank you. So yeah, we have about six messages planned, including the actual event, and so there's a lot of prep work involved in, yeah, like you said, it's, it's equally the same amount of energy that goes into preparation. Follow up on that. Uh, what is your call to action in your emails? What are you trying to get your audience to do? The first in the lead up. Yeah, the first two um, is the invitation to attend the event. Mm-hmm. Okay. 
That's the call to action. And then on the day of is to be able to donate. Mm -hmm. And then after is, um, it's a thank you um, for those who have donated. And then we kind of still do a soft ask for those who haven't donated. Nice. And so for the panel who are participating in Giving Tuesday this year, have you already finished your plan? That is because I want to give everybody in this room who potentially wants to participate that you have time. Uh, what was I teaching the other? I was teaching a year-end campaign the other day, and uh, the statistic is on a year-end campaign, and I typically suggest campaigns no longer than six to eight weeks, so the winter one to not go before November, is that less than, not even 60% of charities, like no one's planned their end of year campaigns for the most part, the majority. So I did it on October 30th. I said, guess what? 60% of nonprofits don't have their year in plan either. That's not really like best practice, but we're all in this together. We're trying to do our best. There is still always time to come up with a thoughtful plan if you still have a month out. That was off the record. Okay, any other tips about planning? Like, I mean, when do you, things like, oh, I have a failure. I wanted to um, do a matching campaign. This is supposed to be the magic bullet, right? If you have a matching campaign at the end of the year or on that Giving Tuesday, you statistically raise 74% more. So this seems to be everybody, everybody wants to have a matching donor, especially on Giving Tuesday. And I dropped the, I felt like I dropped the ball. I didn't get one the first time, I don't know, eight years or so ago, seven years ago. I didn't get a matching major donor in time to, I feel like, really maximize trying this out, maybe six years ago. And uh, so that, yeah, that felt like a failure because that actually takes a bit more time, trying to get a matching donor to really honor um, their time and uh, the whole donor cycle, which is a whole other conversation. So you don't want to just, again, treat them as a business transaction. Uh, it's someone you've cultivated all the year and you want them to do a matching campaign for your Giving Tuesday activation. That might need a little bit more lead time. Just saying. But you still got time. Um, the stat about people giving more when there's a matching donor. Um, there's another stat that I think it's over 100% more will come if people know that another donor has paid for the admin. So oh, yeah. if you can focus Giving Tuesday or thank, thank You Thursday or whatever on you're going to December with, you know, thanks to this group, if you have someone that covers your admin or part of it, people go into December going, so if I give to you 100% of my, I know we want to get away from the 100% goes to programs. I know, I know, I know. But if you have someone who's covering your admin, to be able to release that message at the time that people are thinking, wow, 100% of my donation will go to programs because X is paying for their admin, mm -hmm. you've planted the seed right at the perfect time. Um, and then just back to preparation in advance, if you are doing the stewardship model, um, I would pick three images so that not everyone's getting the same one. Look at your donors, if they're corporate. Um, we were lucky at Music Heals with just how candid our donors were um, who would say to us bluntly, we give these great organizations, but they suck at telling the world they're getting the money from us. Like, okay, <laughs> great to, thank you for telling me that your motivation, there's 87,000 plus charities in Canada. Ask Canada Helps, they, they know <laughs> they've got the list. Um, some are motivated just by how good you make them look. Um, so to be able to provide, you know, if, if that's your goal for Giving Tuesday, we want five of our donors to share this image that we've created for them on Giving Tuesday. So create, create three images now in the next week or so, plop in their logo, plop in your logo, contact them with weeks in advance. Hey, do you wanna post this on Giving Tuesday? Just not asking for anything. We've created the image for you. If you don't use it, that's cool. Um, and just set a goal of, of that many people posting on their channels that they support you on that day. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's one day of graphic design work and a bunch of conversations after that to plant the seeds. What's your favorite tool, panel? What's your favorite tool that you like to use for Giving Tuesday? What are your tools? What do you use? Direct mail? Do you phone people? Do you tweet? Do you Instagram stories? What are the um, things? I, I guess my favorite year that I did it, we yeah. did um, a lot of video stuff. 
Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, so we nice. made personalized thank you videos for, for everyone who donated that day. Um, so Ooh. my <laughs> phone and YouTube. Yeah. Phone and YouTube. You like events. Uh, my favorite tool is partnerships. I mean, I have many. I love them all. Partnerships with a company. I do have to say that Giving Tuesday is an amazing time of year to engage the corporate community. It typically can meet their strategic philanthropic goals, brand awareness, a lot of potential traffic. Uh, they like the stats of the impressions of the hashtag. I mean, 14 billion is Giving Tuesday. Giving Tuesday CA is not that many, but a lot. Um, and this is a great time also that I invite a corporate sponsor in to triple match on that day. There's different tactics that I use on the actual Tuesday. If you donate, if you go into that grocery store, you're partnered with Whole Foods. If you do this, they give back that. And it's an actual, like a real big day that I put a highlight on a corporate sponsor. That is what success looks like to me in stewarding a sponsor who you already have as a sponsor and highlighting their brand. We've used this term stewardship quite a bit up here. Is everybody familiar with this term? Who, yeah? Th this, is, this is how I define in the donor cycle after someone makes a gift, and before they make their next gift, we as fundraisers like to steward them. And I define that stewardship as we like to engage, um, well, thank, recognize their gift, and report back the impact of their gift. Not in necessarily an onerous annual report, but a simple email saying, your $1,000, your $10 did this, thank you, have a nice day. That to me is stewardship. And then, you, anyway, partnerships, one of my favorite tools. So any hot tips for the folks here before I open it up for questions? What is your best takeaway advice to the group here today? I would say do something. <laughs> it's a hot tip. Yeah, I, I think that it's, um, it's a day where kind of, especially in the charity space, um, it's a day where people are sort of aware and looking. So whether it's stewardship, um, whether it's something that you wanna give back or actually leverage it as an opportunity to engage your community or act actually fundraise, like do something. Um, it doesn't have to be as extensive uh, of a campaign. Um, it doesn't have to be a full-blown event, but um, the years where I, I recall us, like the first four years, we just followed sort of the cool, the process that uh, the toolkit offered and, and did the Van Gives, like the image um, on social media. And even though, even though it, didn't yield more than $300, it still got our board and staff to actually consider giving. And that was a little bit of a jump start. And they end up entering into the pipeline of your donor cycle. So yeah, it's better than doing nothing, I would say. Uh, I'd say have, have fun. Um, people, can, ew, people can tell when you're uh, enjoying yourself and being authentic about it. Um, and also don't tire yourself out too much about it because there's still a whole nother month of fundraising to go till year end. Um, I, I would prep your board now um, because chances are you're going to have a board member the week after go, did you know it was Giving Tuesday? <laughs> um, I would prep them now and that it's, it's not about you. It's a day for you to be giving. Um, even if it's just a business opportunity sort of playing on what you were saying of if you have any any partners any donors that have a brick-and-mortar business um, send business to them for the day you know and maybe they'll give you a dollar off the nachos if it's a restaurant or you know they'll call one of their beer um, reps and see if they can get a free keg that they can then give a dollar off of a pint of whatever or a bottle of whatever for the day spend the day driving attention to somebody else um, and Maybe the thing you're prepping in advance is tent cards to go in their in their store or, or poster or whatever. Um, it's it's your day to to gain much more in the long run than to stress about making 300 bucks um, in a day. Thanks. So let's open this up. I think we've got 10 to 12 more minutes. 
questions? Yes. Here you go. Let's Talk see. in the rough direction of the mic. Sure. Um, so this is the first time that we are going to be doing Giving Tuesday. I work at a nonprofit school, um, Kenneth Gordon Maplewood School in North Vancouver. And um, we've partnered with Anytime Fitness, actually, which is a fitness um, <laughs> place right by our. And I just contacted you, I think, yesterday or something. Um, but yeah, and it, uh, so they're like right by us. So our entire community like knows both of us. And I was just wondering what you might suggest for getting people to want to come to the event. Because I think my worst fear is like, these personal trainers are ready we're going to be offering four classes to the event and you know a big fear is like are people going to come and be excited so what would you suggest for getting our community our parents as well as like just anybody else and donors even interested but like you're saying even just focusing not on the money but on the media and the attention The media needs stuff to talk about. I, I just advise everyone, don't be afraid of the media. The media is begging for something to talk about that doesn't have the word Trump in it. <laughs> um, so don't be afraid of letting them know a week in advance that this is what's happening. So it's, it's, it's free training sessions for the day? Yeah, it's by donation. So the donations will go to Kenneth Gordon. Okay. Um, but uh, they're offering the classes for by donation classes. So. Amazing. Yeah. So, I mean, you can talk about it for the weeks leading up to it. Start talking about it now, start planting the seed. Right. Um, corporate social responsibility has become so huge. Um, and understanding the donor, people want to feel good about the money they're already spending. It's one thing to ask someone for a donation, but I was gonna go work out that day anyways. Right, yeah. Or I was gonna go to the climbing wall and instead maybe I'll go to that gym. Like it's, people want to feel good about the money they're already spending. You've given them an opportunity to do their workout there um, the risk of not talking is that no one knows you exist. Right. So the, the worst thing you can do is not share it. Um, but plant those seeds now. People need, might need a couple weeks to hear about it, um, to get in there. The, the media is going to want the photo shoot. Is there a trainer at the studio or the owner of the studio that's not shy about being on camera? There's no guarantee you're going to get it, but that's your goal, Yeah. Um, is to have them talk about that. And, and an interview with you is not as important as an interview with the business of why are you supporting this charity. Mm -hmm. So okay. give them the give them all of the spotlight, right. um, and that's a chance for them to promote their business that day. And if it goes well, they're going to have you back and do this quarter. Right. What's your name? Sorry again. Kenneth Gordon Maplewood School, and hey. yeah, and we've partnered with Anytime Fitness. And your name is Kayla. Kayla. Yeah. Oh, so many opportunities in what you're doing uh, with yeah. that activation. Uh, two things I hear, one, getting people there, which I'm going to speak into in a second. But the second piece is it's not only just getting people there to get a free or by donation workout. It's that if you're partnering with any time, I'm assuming other customers are coming to the gym that day too, right? So it's being able to build out your brand that day, the whole day, and to data capture. So regardless of the people that are taking you up on your specific offer and actually came for that, who are the hundreds of other people that are gonna come through that door that day that you can actually get them excited about enter to win a month free at Anytime Fitness if you sign up for your charity's email there's ethics around ask, making that ask. Um, and then you could potentially, how big is your email list now? Um, Putting me on the stop spot. Few hundred. few hundred, okay. So if you got 100 people, I don't know how many people attend each day, um, but like Black Friday lasts all month now, Giving Tuesday can last a week or two weeks. You can have this activation for a long time. Success to me in that activation is having help getting people into your pipeline um, by doing something like that. But the other piece is getting people to your actual event that you're kind of branding to get these folks out is if you have a list of a few hundred people, it's going to take actual like work. It's not going to be an e-blast that's going to get them all in. It's going to have to be you following up directly and it's going to have to get you getting your allies and influence deployed and your board to call people and be responsible for getting people out to that event this doesn't all fall on you one person you have to have help and amplifiers to get people there but don't miss out on the opportunity the data capture with other customers coming through the door that have never heard of you Instagram, like, 
great activation. Tuesday, I'm going to do one of the free sessions at 2 o'clock. Like, yeah. give them the opportunity to promote you now. Anyone else? Could we answer the I, saw sleeve list I saw your hand. <laughs> I saw your hand. And I mean, it's a chain, right? Franchised. Contact the other ones, too. <laughs> well, if this goes really well, they'll tell all the other chains, this might be a province-wide initiative for you next year. There's your goal. Next year, you're going to tell me your list has 1,500 people, and I'm going to jump up and down. <laughs> Hey guys, um, so I'm Wes, I'm from uh, Big Brothers of Greater Vancouver. Uh, this is my first Giving Tuesday campaign that I'm running. Um, so I just wanted to ask about general uh, philosophy on like quantity of emails to send out to your different audiences, because it's already all segmented out of who I want to speak to. Um, but let's say like the month leading up to Giving Tuesday, what's general philosophy on that? <laughs> um, it it really depends what, what works for, for you and how many emails you're sort of already sending and how you're already, I guess, kind of like talking to your audience. We do one about the first one about a week out, and then we do one the day before. We do two or three the day of, and then we do a thank you on Thursday. Um, yeah, that's all, that's all I really have. As long as you have something to actually say in each one, and they sort of build on each other. Um, it's not so much about the amount of emails for me. Um, what what I like to do, um, especially for Giving Tuesday, uh, for emails, is to uh, to mix them up a bit. So instead of doing them all, you know, like the nice, clean, marketing, branded, you know, your big banner up there, uh, is to make sure at least one or two of them are more uh, are more personal. Even if you're not actually, you know, emailing those people personally, have like a plain text email because especially on Giving Tuesday when your inbox is just like literally full of asks, it, it helps it stand out a little bit and then you can see it comes across more of a follow-up which doesn't feel like a whole nother ask as opposed to what another marketing looking email would be. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> I love that data hack. I love the follow-up, the personal follow-up. I don't think there's such thing as t too many. If you do it with intention. Like, there's 24 hours in a day. This is one of 24. <laughs> well, I was going to say, if you want, I get this question daily, how many emails is too many for any, everything and anything? And I'm like, um, a Democratic primary campaign is too many emails. If you follow any of those campaigns. They literally are like five a day. Um, but in regards to like how many, like you do everything with intention and with a strong call to action and a like throughout the day you're gonna hear from us. And even if someone gave you money, keep them in the pipeline. You just have to segment them out into a different list that is like, thank you for that gift this morning. Um, this is how close we are getting to our goal. If you have like a financial 10K target that day or something, you keep them. It's a stewardship tactic to keep them in your comms that whole day because you want to build momentum. Um, and typically people will give again because they want to get you to your goal. And you're making specific asks, 50 bucks, 10K. You're trying to get to 10K. You have a 10K match, chip in 50 bucks over and over. Thanks for chipping in 50 bucks. We're almost there. Here's your hourly update. No one has the resources to do hourly updates, so don't worry. I'm just kind of being facetious. <laughs> I'm curious to know how many people you've seen do multiple times. Is that something that you see that you I don't know. Yeah, it's a great question. I don't know the statistic on that. So the question was, how many times does one person give multiple times on one day? Is from anecdotally experience. I would if you're doing a giving Tuesday campaign over three days which a happens a lot like a door crack you know I'm, I'm not be kidding like a lot of sales extend a long period of time some folks giving campaigns are like actually three days start the day before like a door crasher um, people do give multiply over days like a lot of people do I would say a quarter of your list will chip in again if they're still getting the emails again right but so often we <gasps> We take them out because <laughs> they've already given them to us. And then they don't hear from us again about the momentum that's building in our campaign. So, but I don't know actually the same day. Somebody try it this year and let me know. <laughs> Thanks. Anyone else have a that scares the hell out of me. Um, I, <laughs> the amount of people Someone's I, unsubscribing from the, my list. Yeah, right? the amount of emails I unsubscribed after the election was over locally. Um, I, <laughs> Google Seth Godin permission asset. 
Seth Godin is the best marketing writer out there. And he talks about the permission asset, which is this idea of every time you send somebody something, you are earning permission to send something else. You are, your asset is that you've entertained them, you've, you've educated them, you've some, whatever the value is defined by whoever you're sending it to. So think of the emails that you get and what value you get from them. They're funny, they're whatever. As soon as you lose that permission asset, they unsubscribe. Um, so I, I, I don't like the ticking of the box of we're gonna send five emails. How are you gonna make email two better than email one and email three better than email two? Because you're going to lose permission to hit these people at Christmas time, um, if you're if if you're just doing it by number. If you're like, if your next email is we're celebrating the people that have committed, like if it's corporate, you know, these people are now on board for our Giving Tuesday event, and this business is now on board. Like, that yeah. that's showing momentum. Um, I think it's awesome that you had 25% people give twice in the three day span. Um, I th I think when you look at communications as a wider thing. On Twitter, people flipping through Twitter, maybe look at the the last hour. So you could post conceivably 24 times in a day and someone would see one, maybe two of them. You did 24 times on email, they're going to come to your door. Um, 24 times on Facebook is too many. The, the answer is different across every channel. Um, the, the, the bar is a lot lower on some than it is on others. Um, so that becomes part of the stress for every communication that you're doing, whether it's you're selling tickets to your gala or it's Giving Tuesday or whatever you're doing. Um. And you all have capabilities of sending a note to somebody who hasn't opened your email, right? It's a different, it's a whole other approach, right? They haven't opened it. I think it's, I think it's a little bit of, it's a bit of a mixed bag because um, we did establish that like it takes what eight touch points before somebody's like willing to give. So we just ran a campaign um, back in September, which was which had I think about thirteen messages over the course of six weeks, and our unsubscribe was like 0.4 percent. Um, it was quite low because the messaging was really robust and there was like a lot of engagement and we really saw the percentage of the click click rates were really high as well. So um, I think it really depends on like what type of content you're putting out there and what your mission is and how you're asking. But um, yeah, it's a little, it's tough because knowing that it takes eight times before somebody or whatever the number is before somebody actually wants to give. I've, uh, I've got feedback just from this past campaign saying, thank you so much for like reminding me again. So like after the fourth message, they actually like followed and kept with us. And then after the fourth message, they're like, oh yes, okay, thank you. Thank you for reminding me. Thanks Reka, like I'm, I'm doing the thing right now. And then a donation comes through. So yeah, I think it's a bit mixed. It depends on your content. So like, I mean, Amanda's a little, we, we kind of argue over content because Amanda likes it cut and dry and I'm like, no, it has to have a, a narrative and... Dry. <laughs> yeah, and so, yeah, that, that's what I could offer. It's a bit mixed. You do have to balance the needing to get their attention but also not overwhelming them and losing them. Anyone else? We have one minute. Mike coming at you. Hi there, I'm Sky. I'm curious to hear a little bit about your segmenting tactics as well in getting new donors in the door versus approaching existing and, and retention. Confession time, our segmentation is awful. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's a... Uh, it, we, we know it and it is, it's a, it's a technical limitation for us right now. Um, ideally, yes, you, you would be, you'd be talking to people who haven't donated differently than people who are already monthly, monthly givers, different from people who donated to, you know, peer to peer fundraising events. Um, I think in, in everything that you do, you'd be segmenting them. Um, but yeah, just in case anyone else is feeling bad about it, we're awful at it. <laughs> Segmentation. What organization are you with? Oh, you do a partnership. You do a Giving Tuesday. Um, 
Don't you? I'm only there a few months. Okay, never mind. Okay, it was someone else last year. Yay, welcome. Okay, uh, I love segmenting. I love segmenting. You can segment in Excel as well, right? If you have some sort of criteria that can distinguish what your segment is and sort that way. So you don't need a fancy CRM, although they're amazing. Uh, and when it comes to a Giving Tuesday campaign that has a financial goal attached to it, I definitely segment between um, a renewal segment, like a current donor, and other ways that I have people in my database. And who are those people that live in my database? They came to an event, they bought a ticket, et cetera, and so forth. They get an ask for sure. I call it an acquisition ask. Pardon? Yeah. Oh, we know your colleague. But everybody, if that's my campaign, our campaign, they're all getting a financial ask. But if I'm trying to build engagement and increase uh, our email list and drive people to our website, different ask with my segmentation. Like it's a greater universe. Like how is your tactic trying to get people involved in the pipeline that way? Yes, you were wanting to ask a question earlier. Yes. Yeah, it sounds like you're already doing it pretty much exactly right. Um, I think also make sure that you like, you know, reward the people who are actually doing it, whether you're retweeting it or liking it or however else. Oh. Yeah, schedule everything that you're doing so that you can spend the day just hitting retweet and reacting to everyone else. It's a great call to action. And who are you sending it to? You're sending it like I would recommend to your volunteers. It's such a great activation for a volunteer. People want to feel involved. And this is, and to not only, I call it social media um, amplifiers, allies, influencers, to join the list of that and how powerful that is. Again, what does success look like? If you had a thousand engagements on a post, that's not going to bring in money. Someone's not going to jump the queue and all of a sudden give you money, but that's so successful because you want to try and then convert them into um, getting them on the, your email list. My favorite thing. My favorite thing. Anything else? I think that's. I think we're good. Um, I was just gonna say I have a uh, deck that has laid out steps one, step two, perfect magic bullets. How many emails to send? When to start sending them? Um, that we can circulate after this too. And then my contact information is there. I have, for people in this room, time for one-on-one um, -on -one follow up, half an hour, hour chats about your campaign and particular and just uh, be a coach and a soundboard for you. Thanks panelists for coming. Yay! So yeah, actually I'm about to turn the screen on and I don't want to blind my poor panelists, so I'll send you back home.
And I will keep this one. We'll kill that one. Perfect. Do, do, everything is going to work beautifully, turning itself slowly on. So remember when I promised you one minute update homework? Well, that time is now. So here's the deal. What you're going to do is you're going to come up here, you're going to give your name, and then you're going to get one minute to tell people about the amazing thing you're doing or need. Um, I will be here like a jerk with a watch, timing you to one minute, I'll give you a dirty look. After 60 seconds, maybe you'll be faster and we'll have room for more people. Um, but it's going to be super fun. It's going to be fast paced. Um, and do not be shy. Apparently, I don't know how to hit buttons. How present. There we go. The non shiny button. So here's a model it for you. It's going to go like this Hi, my name is Eli, and I'm one of the co organizers of Net Squared Vancouver. We're starting to plan out our series of events for the coming year. And we're looking to bring on a couple new event producers into the team, people who can come and basically play the Amanda role, put together a panel and like lead one topic through the year. We'll be here to backstop all the other things, the meetup, all the event planning. Your job is to be the fancy person out front, you know, putting it all together. Et voila, like that. So uh, if you're interested in participating in this, you need to come right up here to the front. We'll create a little queue and... Uh, We'll fire things up, and if you need me to bring up a website in the meantime, I got fast little fingers, and we'll make that happen for you. So, I know you're all doing interesting things. I know some people are planning events. Maybe you should come up here and invite people to participate in that great event. Model it for us. Come, come, come. Woo! <laughs> Um, artstarts.com. We Got haven't. It. You can see our mission. Okay. Hi. Again, my name is Reka. I'm with Art Starts in Schools. As you've heard, I'm planning an event on December 3rd. Um, we are. So excited to host an evening of singing together as we explore creativity um, within all of us. Um, it's a night that will have wine, nibbles, and the amazing Vanessa Richards, for anybody who knows her. Yes, she runs uh, a choir, a free choir for the community, and it's been on hiatus, but guess what? We've been able to work with her to create a beautiful evening of uh, coming together as community. And that's our Giving Tuesday event. Sounds amazing. Nice work. All right. Who else has got something super cool to share? Or maybe you're new in town and you're just like, looking for someone to work with. Anyone else got a thing? Come on, shy friends. Come on up. Come on up. Do the quick intro and off you go. Can I get you to just Google um, Big Brothers of Greater Vancouver volunteer opportunities? Okay. Hi again. Uh, my name is Wes. I work for Big Brothers of Greater Vancouver. Uh, my role primarily focuses on uh, marketing and volunteer recruitment. So although this isn't related to Giving Tuesday, it's more on volunteering. Um, I'm sure most of you have heard of Big Brothers, but to give a bit of context about what we do, uh, we facilitate uh, uh, child and youth volunteer-led mentorship programs. Um, most of the programs we we're looking for volunteers for are for those 18 and above. Uh, if you want to scroll down a little bit, there's a quick little synopsis of what we do. Um, most of you have heard of the Big Brother program. It's two to four hours once a week for a year. But there's also some short-term programs for uh, throughout the school year, and one that I actually I volunteer in called Game On. That's eight weeks. So, if you have any questions, feel free to get in touch. Lovely, awesome, thank you. Yep. Sweet, come on up, come on up. What do you want me to hunt? Uh, Beautynight.org would be great. Hi, I'm Caroline McGillivray, and I'm the founder and executive director of Beauty Night Society. What we do is provide programming to build self-esteem and changing the lives of women and youth living in poverty. 
and we've been doing this for years. It's actually coming up to our 19th anniversary, so woohoo! <laughs> and we've done over 78,000 makeovers as a way to reintroduce touch to people who've experienced violence and reconnect them to community. What my ask is, is we are looking at um, just trying to increase our volunteers for helping for communications, fundraising, and as well as that, because we're also adding another chapter doing the makeovers as well for seniors who are dealing with dementia. So we're, that's going to be our next chapter. So if you know anybody, please send them our way. Thank you. Anyone else got a project on the go? Come on up. Hey everyone, I'm Kevin. Um, we just recently registered a nonprofit and got, are in process of getting a charitable status uh, just a few weeks ago. Um, so given, having said that, we're relatively new. We need all kinds of help. Justice Network is the nonprofit and uh, we have lots of opportunities. So you can probably go take a look at that. Uh, we need, so if you're in fundraising but you need uh, experience in a different aspect of nonprofit organizations, please reach out to us. We need help. We're literally at the foothills of a very great, uh, uh, you know, movement on improving justice delivery and uh, human rights records around the world. We're doing lots of stuff on technology side using data science, machine learning, and also uh, we need help with obviously fundraising and stuff. So I'm, I'm going to stick around and pick your brains after, <laughs> but uh, please reach out. We, we need a lot of help in our nonprofit. Thank you. Great. Thank you. All right, who wants to come next? That's Joel. What do you want me to I don't worry about it. Uh, how about it for Amanda and the amazing panelists again? Let's, I just want to say thank you. That was really awesome. Uh, my name is Joel Harrison, and um, I'm working on starting a new podcast, actually. And so the podcast is going to be focused on interviewing social entrepreneurs, nonprofit leaders, and change makers. And I'm interested in talking to people that are at the forefront of making some kind of change, whether it's in their nonprofit, maybe they're the executive director, maybe they're starting a new nonprofit. Um, and I want to share really unique stories, and I want to share the successes and the wins and the struggles and uh, yeah, just help build that community up of people who are really making change. So um, if you know of anyone or if you are interested in being interviewed on my upcoming podcast, I'm hoping to launch within the next kind of three or four weeks. And uh, yeah, come find me. I'm Joel. Thanks. You guys are going lightning fast. I bet we have room for two more people. Come on up. Hi, I'm Kayla. Um, as I mentioned, we're Forgiving Tuesday. Um, I, well, first of all, I work at Kenneth Gordon Maplewood School, which is um, a school that helps kids who have dyslexia, autism, ADHD, anxiety, and other learning-based um, learning difficulties and challenges. Um, we're a K to 12 school. We're nonprofit, and uh, we are doing a fitness event with Anytime Fitness on Giving Tuesday. As I mentioned, we're really excited about it. It's our first time. And we're also trying to get the word out about our school to people around Vancouver and North Vancouver. We're located in North Vancouver, um, but we take students from all over. That We had a student from Saskatchewan, but a lot of these kids come in and they've learned how to read for the first time, and they're at a lower level reading for you know what they should be at, and it's really inspiring. They're all very inspiring kids. So if you know somebody or anybody who might you know benefit from coming to our program, let them know about us. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Coming up, Jean. Hi, everyone. My name is Jean. I'm one of the co-organizers with the team here. And my day job is with Peace Geeks. Ian, my teammate, is here today. I recruited him last Last month, introduced him to Netsquare Van, and he came back today. So that's awesome. Uh, he's one of our developers. So Peace Geeks is a nonprofit tech. We have an office here at the back at the Hive. Uh, one of the projects that we do is Arrival Advisor. We won a 2017 Google Impact Challenge grant to create an app that helps refugees and immigrants to find um, 
to, to find settlement services in BC. Uh, we partnered with BC 211 Directory Service as well as BC Newcomers Guide. So exciting news that we can share is that we have been selected as one of the top three finalists for the UX for Good category. Um, so there is a demo day where people have the opportunity to vote for People's Choice Awards, so you have to be there. So it's this Thursday, if you're free, you want to check us out and check out the other UX designers at the table. Uh, you can check their uh, website, it's Fan UX Award. You, you can just Google that and you can see all the finalists from this year. Yeah, and if you want to chat more about the app or Peace Geeks, let Ian and I know. Thanks. Come on up. Hey, uh, my name is Chris. Uh, one of my clients is a local ticketing agency called Event Chain, and you will get in your follow-up email an offer that they're doing. If you do decide to do a Giving Tuesday event, uh, is they are much like an Eventbrite uh, kind of platform. Uh, they will waive all fees for a Giving Tuesday event. Doesn't need to be on Giving Tuesday. Uh, the code, which is just simply Giving Tuesday 2019. Again, this will be in your email coming from Eli as a follow-up. Uh, if you're doing an event, and furthermore, there's a nonprofit program and more opportunities to help nonprofits with any ticketing that you're doing for event-wise to help you keep more of that money. Um, I'm probably going to take off quickly after this because I have one-year-old twins and my wife will kill me if I'm out late. Eli knows full well. Um, so any questions about that or anything else, uh, Chris at charityagency.ca or just find Charity Agency on all the social media channels. Great. Nice. Thank you. And one last one, here we go. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Here. Woo! Quick intro, because they don't know about you. A man already introed me, but I'm Tamara. I'm from Canada Helps. I'm based here. I'm the only one outside of uh, Toronto that is with Canada Helps. Um, so I'm here to support charities of all sizes. Um, we create fundraising tools and make them as barrier-free, as affordable as possible. We co-launched Giving Tuesday several years ago, along with Give3. Um, and yeah, I'm at my email is tamara r at canadahelps.org if you want to reach me. But yeah, thanks for the great panel. It was awesome. She's so helpful. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! It's right in there in the name Canada Helps. <laughs>